Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, I'm I'm very excited to be here with all of you to learn some Torah. And uh, before I get started, I, I know many of you are very ex experienced in the Mind Jewish Learning Torah study, but I'll say some of my own kind of ground rules, rules and philosophy just to, to get us started in a way I hope that will participate. And um, I know there are a lot of us here, which is incredible so exciting um to be with all of you and and so it is i find it you know in in groups of the size it might be a little harder to do some discussion but i do really want to hear from you and so i encourage you there'll be times where i stop to ask questions and if you feel comfortable and you want to unmute you know i'll take a few of those um and if you want to write in the chat maybe if it's a little scary to speak in front of all these people which i totally identify with <laughs> um feel free to write something in the chat or if you're even feeling maybe self-conscious about everyone seeing the chat you can just write it to me and i won't read your name out loud but if there's something that it feels like relevant to bring into the discussion i might read a piece of it um but it depends on how hopping the chat is and how busy it is how much I, i'll be able to follow that um because i'll share my screen in a moment so it's uh lots of, of reading and multitasking but yeah so i really encourage you to um share your voice go in the chat um and yeah kind of have discussions with each other around that and because i firmly believe that everyone has their own Torah to teach, right? We all have different life experiences and different viewpoints. And I think it's really beautiful when we're able to add those into the discussion, even if you're not a rabbi, right? We don't, you don't need to be a rabbi to have your Torah and to have this wisdom. So I really invite you all to share in ways that feel meaningful and uh, constructive. So that is my little intro. So, oh my gosh, Parshat Bo, such a great Parsha. I say that about almost every Parsha, but there's there's a lot of good stuff in this week's Parsha. So when I was trying to draw out what we were going to learn together, I uh, had some trouble because there's so many good things. So I, 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 I picked two specific things out that we will go through. And my goal today is I wanted to, one, give you something, some interesting tidbit um, to think about over Shabbat and um also something that feels relevant to our lives so those are kind of the two goals and if we're lucky kind of a third goal is um you'll have something interesting to share on your passover table if you remember um so you can even can even bring passover and i know it's it feels like it's forever away but it'll come soon enough and then so maybe you'll even get a tidbit there to impress people at your seder um and i can share or julie will share um the link to the source sheet in the chat and you do not need to bring it up i will i will screen share in a moment but just if you want it, you can just file it away for passover and then impress all of your friends and family so there you go um i think that's enough for words of introduction so we're going to jump in uh so this parsha we have the last three plagues uh, so first we have locusts and then darkness and then death of the firstborn. And we're going to take a look at darkness today. Um, I always kind of wondered, especially growing up when we read through the 10 plagues and you think about, I would think, okay, the 10 plagues are probably you know, getting more and more intense as they go on, right? So the first one was a little bit mild and then, okay, it's kind of escalating and escalating. So why is darkness the ninth plague, right? Like darkness I don't know. I experience darkness every night when the sun goes down. Most people do, unless you're living on like the North Pole or the South Pole at certain times when the sun doesn't set. But darkness is a pretty common occurrence. So what is it about this darkness plague that is so severe and what is kind of the nature of the darkness plague? So we're going to take a look at that. Um, I am going to share my screen and take a breath because i just was talking really fast i will slow down okay here we go da -da -da. okay here we go people want to just nod if they can see yes okay julie says yes great okay i will okay and i will also say i've included hebrew in some of these sources and if hebrew is not your thing don't worry about it if we use any of the hebrew i'll explain what it means it's just for reference there so that said we're going to read i'll read the english so this is exodus chapter 10 verses 21 to 23 so it says then god said to moses hold out your arm toward the sky that there may be darkness upon the land of egypt 
a darkness that can be touched. Hold on to that idea. Moses held out his arm towards the sky and thick darkness descended upon all the land of Egypt for three days. People could not see one another. And for three days, no one could get up from where he was, but all the Israelites enjoyed light in their dwellings. So we have God telling Moses, okay, you're going to bring on the darkness. And it's this, this darkness has a special quality to it. And so the rabbis, they, they see this and they're kind of wondering what, what does all this mean? What is, what is the nature of this darkness? So first, of course, we have our special commentator, Rashi. Um, and so he picks up on this, this phrase in the in um, Exodus 10, 21, I'll just go back up. Sorry, I'm scrolling a lot. Um, so here, Vayamash, Vayamesh, Vayamesh Choshech, right? So, um, so what's, what's that mean? Um, it's this idea of like a darkness in the translation. It says a darkness that can be touched, which again, all translation is an interpretation. So, so what, what are they interpreting here? So Rashi says, Vayamesh Choshech, and what he says, it will darken more dark than the darkness of night. Darkness of night will dim and darken more. Um, and so if you see in the Hebrew here, I've, I've highlighted this word, ya'amish. Um, so what Rashi is saying here is that ya'amish, this one, is actually like the word ya'amish, um, which means to darken. And it's taken from the root amesh, which is aleph mem shin which can mean, which actually in modern Hebrew means last night. Um, so it's something to do with darkness. And in this form of the verb, it's a dark, it's making something dark. So it's making it extra dark. Um, and so he explains like, why is there a missing olive? Okay, he's very, being very thorough. He says, Yamish means as much as, is a contraction of Yamish, right? So it's this darkness. We have many words in which an olive is omitted since the sound of the olive is not very marked. Scripture is not particular about omitting it. So, and then Rashi goes on to list a bunch of examples of why, you know, there's a, a verb where the olive should be there and it's missing. So, okay, this is like a normal phenomenon and that's what it means. But of course, there's another interpretation of this word, um, and it says a midrashic statement explains that it is in the sense of which means like groping or touching kind of from like mamash as well, if that's a familiar word to you. So that the meaning would be that it was of such a double character and so thick that there was something tangible in it. So think about, I don't know, like kind of do a visioning of like, what is darkness? Um, it's this darkness that it's not normal night darkness, right? it's darker than that. Um, and it's something that can be felt. Uh, I, I was I've been trying to kind of envision what that would what, what that would be like to like feel the darkness maybe it was some kind of mist or something I'm not sure if other people have uh, thoughts that you want to share in the chat of what um, that darkness they're blinded darkness is the absence of light yet yeah, no light but what does it mean to touch oh I see something about smog London experience four to five day great smog yeah yeah, so it's it, that can be touched. Yeah, that like pollution and dark and the ash. Um, yes. Okay, I see some great comments. I'm gonna just try and read some of them out loud. Oh yeah, thick smoke. Uh huh. Um, a light could mean the absence of goodness. So we're gonna go on. We're gonna we're not done with darkness just yet. Yes, a blanket. Oh, interesting. Yes. Um, black fog. Yes. Okay. And and there are there are lots of different interpretations around what the plagues mean and what they are trying to do. And there's definitely one kind of line of thought that says, okay, the each plague is to go up against one of the Egyptian gods. And so the sun god was one of the main Egyptian gods. So by darkness, you're saying, okay, like if God can control light and dark and make it totally dark, God is more powerful than your sun god. Um, ooh, middle of a forest and a moonlit night, darkness. Excessive heat and humidity can feel like a heavy, wet blanket. Yes, a sandstorm, which probably makes sense in Egypt. Yes, okay, so keep going. I'm gonna go back to white out of snowstorms, the form of darkness. Ooh, okay, yes, Cause so keep it going in the chat and feel free to share more. So, we're, ooh, sensory deprivation, yes. Oh, like when you sleep, one of those kind of pods. I always wanted to do that. 
Ooh, maybe we should all, maybe that should be our homework. Let's all go experience darkness <laughs> in one of those salt pods, if it's safe where you are. Um, okay, great. So I'm gonna keep going a little bit and then I will also pause in a little to take um, actual comments um, out loud, but please continue to write in the chat and thank you all for sharing that. Okay, so we'll keep going. Okay, so now we are at, oh, this, the spacing, I don't like it. Here we go, gotta get it all on one page. So this is from a Midrash, this is Midrash Tanhuma on the same verse. I'm just gonna move the chat box away. So um, again, it says, this is the original verse quotation, it stretch out your hand towards heaven that there may be darkness. Um, and so they're asking, okay, where did the darkness come from? What's the nature of this darkness, right? So maybe let's see if any of them agree with some of your ideas. Um, Rabbi Judah and Rabbi Nehemia discussed this question. Rabbi Judah held it descended from the darkness of the upper regions. As it said, oh, I should have changed this. God made darkness God's hiding place, God's pavilion around about God, right? So this idea that God in heaven, darkness was where God was hiding. Okay, so maybe the darkness came from heaven, while Rabbi Nehemia argued that it ascended from the darkness of the netherworld, as it is stated, a land of thick darkness as darkness itself, a land of the shadow of death without any order and where the light is as darkness. Um, so, right, so both so there's kind of something almost supernatural about this, this darkness. And so Rabbi Judah says it's coming from, from heaven, from the upper regions, it's coming down. And then Rabbi Nehemiah is like, no, it's not coming from, it's coming from the nether region, right? Shul, um, that, that this, this land of darkness. Um, so there you go, that's just another view. Okay, so now I have Ramban. Um, and he's also commenting, and he's commenting on this piece of, um, they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place. The meaning thereof is that this darkness was not a mere absence of sunlight where the sun set and it was like night. Rather, it was a thick darkness, that's a quote, that is to say, it was a very thick cloud that came down from heaven. Okay, so Ramban's like team cloud, <laughs> uh, team mist. It is for this reason that God said, stretch out thy hand towards heaven to bring down from there a great darkness, which would descend upon them and which would extinguish every light, just as in all deep caverns and in all extremely dark places where light cannot last as it is swallowed up in the density of the thick darkness. So we have nice cave imagery here. Similarly, people who pass through the mountains of darkness find that no candle or fire can continue to burn at all. So side note, mountains of darkness, you can find them in, in the Talmud and uh, the kind of rabbis are assuming they're somewhere kind of in Africa, but they hadn't really been to Africa, so they didn't really know what they're talking about. But so there are these mountains, there's mythic mountains, it's not super important. So these mythic mountains that are very tall, and so maybe it's, you know, altitude, and someone can probably, I, I feel like there's someone on here who can verify this or not, but if you're at really high altitude where there's less oxygen, is it harder for things to burn up? Or like, can you burn, can you have fire in space with an absence of oxygen? Um, so kind of that idea. I imagine so because fire needs oxygen to burn. So, right, so this, this high altitude where you can't light a fire because there isn't enough air for it. So that's kind of what this darkness is like and that you can't puncture it. Um, yes. Okay. Similar. Da, da, da. Um, it's for this reason. They saw not one. Sorry, I'm here. Uh, it is for this reason that they saw not one another, neither rose from any place for otherwise they would have used the light of fire. This was not the usual absence of daylight above, but an extraordinary darkness as well. It is possible that this was such a very thick cloud that there was something tangible in it, as our rabbis have said. And as indeed it happens on the Atlantic Ocean, as Rabbi Abraham Ibn Ezra testified. Um, so that's also, I feel like Ramban here gave us a bunch of possibilities of what it could be like. So there's that idea of mist, of a cloud, of being kind of high up in this darkness on a mountain. I'm just gonna take a moment to look at the chat. Okay, yes, lots, lots of good things here. Lots of great uh, comments. I'm just 
I'm going to take us off a little bit off track or a side note, not off track, but uh, so I'm not going to get them all out loud right now. But yes, please continue sharing and thank you for adding your thoughts. Okay, so we're going to take a side note about this nature of darkness. So we've talked about what it might be like, um, and we're going to get a few other different opinions. So um, here, and I say spoiler alert because this is from next week's Parsha, but don't worry, I won't go into it too much because I don't want to ruin it for you. But this is actually just two verses after Bo ends. So this is in Parsha Bashach. So it's, you know, Bo ends at chapter 13, verse 16. And here we're in chapter 13, verse 18. And, and it's interesting, I think, I think about this a lot actually, is how we've you know, divided up the Torah into Torah portions, which are divided thematically, but there also is a lot of connection between. So sometimes when we only study the Parsha, we kind of miss some of the connection. So I wanted to just bring in a little bit, if you will humor me. Um, and so this is from 1318. So it's God leading the people out. To freedom. So it says, so God led the people round about by the way of the wilderness at the Sea of Reeds. Now the Israelites went up armed out of the land of Egypt. Okay, so why is this significant at all? Well, great question. So it's because of this word, I highlighted it in the Hebrew. Here I'll highlight it again. It says Hamushim, right? So Hamushim, which they translate here in the English as armed, but there is some debate about how do you translate this word hamushim. It's an un, it's a, a strange word, but what's going on here? And so hamushim sounds like the word hamish, five. Um, and so there are some midrashim that pick up on this idea of five, and they say actually it's because only one in five Israelites actually left Egypt. It's really interesting. Or one in five were killed. So we're going to see here. So it says hamushim. Um, oh, hum, armed and humash have the same consonants. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly, Joseph, because humash um, is taken from the root for five, right? Because humash is also like in Greek, I think the Pentateuch is the first five books of the Torah. So that's why it's called the humash is five hamushim. So a good connection, right? So they're seeing this connection with five. So they say hamushim went up from the land of Egypt. So this is the Mechilta de Rabbi Ishmael. So what do they say? One out of five have been there. So one out of five left, right? So that's 20%. That's a low percentage. Um, others say one out of 50, right? So they're, they're again, like five, 50, 500. These all have the same root. They're going to have sound, sound similar. One out of 50 went, up, went out of Egypt. So that's the vast majority, right? That's what 98% of the Israelites actually stayed in Egypt, according to this person. Others say one out of 500. Rabbi Nahori says, I swear not one in 500 went up, for it is written, this is a proof text, I made you as numerous as the plants of the field. And the children of Israel were fruitful and teamed and multiplied and became extremely strong, and the land was filled with them. And women would bear six in one birth, and you say one in 500 went up, not one in 5,000, many of the Jews having died in Egypt. When, and here, here's the, the part that relates it back, when, when did they die? In the three days of darkness of which it is written, one man did not see another. They, the Jews were burying their dead and they gave thanks and praise to the Holy Blessed One that their foes did not see and rejoice in their downfall. Okay, so yes, I see. Um, okay, so I see some questions about this Midrash. So. In general, a, a midrash is is kind of this this commentary, this story. They're trying to fill in a blank about um, something that says in the Torah. So this midrash is trying to figure out why it says this word hamushim, which sounds like five. And and I don't think this is meant to be taken literally. This is this is more of a, a kind of a a a play in a way. It's a a play on the words. It's not necessarily saying, okay, only one in five people went out, but it's saying, okay, like, what if that meant this? And, and how do we learn from it? If that makes sense. Um, and, and actually in a lot of other ones. So, so next week when you're studying the Parsha, <laughs> um, you can look at different interpretations of this as well. And you'll see that a lot of people actually disagree with this interpretation. They, they are not having it. Um, but again, this is not a, a a class on next week's Parsha, so I just signaled out the one that um, that kind of went to what I thought was relevant here. But so, so a lot of people say everyone left Egypt, or only a few people stayed behind. But uh, here we have this, and and what they say is that they 
they died and, and other people are saying that's because they were wicked or there were a lot of Israelites who just didn't want to leave. Um, and, and when, according to this Midrash, which again, is not the truth or the only way to read this, definitely not. Um, they say they, they died in the three days of darkness, um, which is the plague we were talking about. And I included this in here because it hints to me that the darkness here was actually something a lot more intense um, than than we might have first thought of, right? That, that oh my gosh, if all these Israelites are, are dying, at least according to this one Midrash that day, that there's something else going on here. Um, and, right, and I think we, we'll, we have hints and we can think about what we think it might be, like what is so hard about this darkness, um, right? Darkness as despair, exactly. Um, yes, so, so yeah, so there's, there's something happening here in this darkness that that is that's really difficult and it's also difficult for the israelites even though it talks about the israelites having light in their dwellings so there you go okay so now so now i want to bring in some of the more modern commentaries on darkness and again thanks to rabbi sari laffer who um i found these um because of her and and i like them and and i think that um this also to me hints back to why the darkness might have been so hard, these, these uh, two texts. So I'll read them and then we will pause. So this is from Evan HaEzel, who is Isser Zalman Meltzer from the okay, when he lived. Um, he said, so the, again, we have the original text. They did not see one another, neither did any rise from their place for three days. The greatest darkness is when a person does not see their fellow and does not participate in the distress of others. They did not see one another means they did not feel the other's distress. Their senses were dulled. Neither did any rise from their place. I think these two go together. So I'll read them together. And so Eshkol Mamarim, which is a collection of these Chabad Hasidic teachings says, there's a thick darkness and they did not see one another for three days. If a person does not see their fellow or does not want to see him, there is darkness in the world. Right? And so I don't think this is about, because I was thinking about, you know, I don't think this is about us just social distancing, right? I don't think that's that's what they're talking about here. It's it's something more, right? It's and and again, I'd love to hear in the chat or, or to hear your comments in a moment about about um, what you're taking from these texts, right? It's about kind of a lack of 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 empathy, right? It says does not participate in the distress of others. And that is what is showing darkness, um, right? It's, it's, it's about not seeing. And I think seeing they're taking, it's a metaphorical seeing. It's not like, oh, I don't see you. It's a, I don't understand you. I don't perceive you in a way. I don't see what your needs are. I don't see that you're suffering. Um, and yeah, this, and I think it's also maybe a little bit about loneliness. Um, so, okay, I see a lot of <laughs> things in the chat. So I wanna go back and say, yes, darkness as not understanding, such as the huge division in the country right now. Yeah, exactly, right? This, this lack of understanding, lack of empathy. Um, yeah, hopelessness. I think that's definitely in here, that darkness, that hopelessness, right? That all these metaphorical darknesses, um, darkness in our world due to COVID restrictions. I mean, I think, there's definitely a loneliness right, that it's the, and, and I think necessary. I mean, I don't want to get into public health discussion here because that is not my expertise. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a, a loneliness. And, and I think that, right, this plague of darkness almost points us to needing to make sure that we are connecting with people, even if we're not physically in their presence. How do we connect with people and how to connect to others suffering and distress and have that empathy? Um, yeah, it's like we see something bad going on in the world and we ignore it. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, yeah. So so a lot of you are raising really great points in the chat. Um, okay, I see people's hands up. Um, so, okay, so we'll go Aaron and then here, I'm gonna stop screen sharing for a sec so we can all see each other better. Um, here we go, stop share. Okay, okay, great. So let's do Aaron and then Tanya. Um, so <clears throat> the way that I immediately interpreted the 
darkness in this Parsha is not as like a physical darkness. Although I did see someone mention like kind of like the smog that was in Victorian London, like that's a cool idea, mm -hmm. but uh, more of a mental anguish and a depression. Um, and I think that that's something that we can relate to during our current times um, that if you're in a lot of pain and experiencing a lot of pain, sometimes it can be really easy to focus on your own situation and not pay attention to what everybody else is, has going on. Um, I know like uh, for me, like these past couple of weeks, I've been really focused on myself. Um, and it's a good thing to focus on yourself and, and take care of yourself, but it's also important if someone, especially if someone reaches out to you to say something and maybe part of why the Israelites do experience more light during this time is because of an increased connection offered by their, their universal, um, beliefs of, um, one God and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Erin, for, for pointing that out and making that connection. And yeah, I mean, I think there's, I'm not trying to say, oh, we shouldn't care about ourselves. Right. But definitely to, to balance that, like, how are we taking care of ourselves? And also how are we remembering that there are other people out there? So yeah, thank you. Okay. Tanya. And then I see Esther. Okay. Rabbi, uh, could the darkness possibly be an outward manifestation. You know how Zaharat or leprosy was an outward manifestation of an inward condition? And could the darkness probably be uh, an outward manifestation or a manifestation in nature, how things were in Egypt and, you know, maybe the hardness of Paro's heart? Mm, yeah, I mean, I definitely think that especially as we talk about darkness in this emotional sense of, of not having connection, I think, yeah, it's that definitely is a representative outside of what's going on inside. Yeah. Thank you, Tanya. Um, and yeah, I just want to read. And then Esther, I know I haven't forgotten about you. Um, right. Micah, you said after this is after eight plagues, we can see how they would have sunk into hopelessness, right? Yeah, exactly. Like there is this hopelessness. So it makes sense that the darkness is coming in at this point. Um, yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, Esther. I actually have two comments. Okay. The first one, I like to connect the song as Yeshua Moshe to what you were talking about numbers. They said that only one in five left Egypt. And so that's why the song of Az Yashir is in the future and not in the past, because each and every one of them was in a dark place because part of their family or friends remained in Egypt. And that's why they sing like for the future in the time of the Mashiach. The second thing that I wanted to comment on was the opposite of dark. First of all, I see three levels of darkness of, of the three days because it can be dark, but you can still see some, but the darkness intensified, so I think it's three. But the opposite of darkness is light, as God said, and there was light and he saw that it was good. And made me think of Plato's Republic at the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of significance there too, to the light and darkness. And, and yeah, I think that's another, connection another thread of commentary around plagues as being kind of the undoing of creation and this one is you know the very first act of creation is light and then we're going into darkness um yes uh okay so many great things in the chat okay so now i'm going to make a very uh abrupt transition, which is appropriate because the same thing happens in the Parsha. So um, right after the ninth plague, we get the 10th plague, which is um, death of the firstborn. And so God's saying, okay, this is what's going to happen. And, and the Israelites get ready. And it's like very suspenseful. And then before it happens, we get this phrase, dot, 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 suspense. I'm going to share my screen. Um, boop. Okay, here we go. So suspense, suspense, suspense. This is Exodus chapter 12, verses one and two. So we're waiting for the 10th plague. And here we have, God said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of the months. It shall be for the first of the months for the year for you. Okay. And then we get a whole, 
kind of calendar and, and talking about Passover, and we get a lot of laws. So it's kind of interspersed, like right in the middle of the story, we get kind of a, a little break. It's a very dramatic break, and, and we get the, the first Passover. But first we get this commandment, which is about Rosh Chodesh, the new month. And um, yeah, and this is actually the first commandment given specifically to the Jews. So we have a lot of, we have some commandments given before, right? We have, you know, from first commandment in the Torah about like Peru being fruitful and multiplying, which uh, someone I know translated as, and I'm forgetting who it is, so I apologize, um, but as being fruity and fabulous, uh, which I think is more fun. Um, but so we, there are different kind of commandments that we have gotten earlier that are more universal. And this is the first one to the Jews or the Israelites, right? And so it's, you have to mark time, which I think is super interesting and cool. So we'll, we'll get into that briefly because I know we are watching the time. So we're going to take us back to uh, Rashi on Genesis chapter one, went all the way back and, and uh, he brings up this verse about it being the beginning of months, marking the month. So he says, he's quoting, Rabbi Isaac said, the Torah, which is the law book of Israel, should have commenced with the verse, this very verse, the months shall be unto you the first of months, right? Which is the first commandment given to Israel? Okay, great, just said that. So you can see that I didn't make that up. Rashi says it too. <laughs> and what is the reason then that, that it commences with the account of creation? Because of the thought expressed in the text, God declared to God's people the strengths of God's works. And, and he kind of goes on to say, okay, why? Right, There's, it's a good question. Okay, if the Torah is the book for the Jews, um, why doesn't it start with something, with the laws that are specific to Jews? Why do we start with creation? Why do we go back that far? We could just start here. And I mean, I think there's the, the practical answers of like, well, all, a lot of the good stories are in Genesis. So I'm, I mean, I'm glad it's there. Um, but it's also about, I mean, so Rashi's answer is kind of to say, oh, because God created everything to show God's power and God's kind of universality. And, um, but yeah, it's also the universal versus the particular. I think this is Rabbi Art Green that talked about um, how it's saying, okay, we're connected, right? It's not just about the Jews. It's about all of us. And we're all connected. We are all created, you know, from this one person, according to the story. But it's about to, to just highlight that, um, that we do have a common ancestor, things in common, that there is that universality. And now we get to the particular as well. So we kind of have both here. Um, so I think it's like just an interesting question, an interesting thing to ponder of, okay, could have started the book here, but instead we started um, way back in Genesis. Um, okay, yes, I see, okay, some of these comments, it's a uh, spoiler alerts for, for a later one, but yeah, exactly, they were talking about marking time, um, and um, marking time is something you can only do when you're free, yeah, so we're going to see that in a moment in the, uh, in another commentator, but yeah, it's, right, what, it, what is it about time, and, and you know, Jewish time, um, and, and the Jewish calendar that's really becomes the first the first thing we're commanded to, to mark and think about and the significance of time in Judaism. Okay, so now we're going to go back to Rashi on this very verse. So before we get to more of the nature of time, we're going to pick up on this word hazeh. So now I'm going to scroll back up so you didn't see it in the original. So he says here, hachodesh hazeh. So chodesh means like new, like chadash, new, and chodesh, like a new moon. So chodesh also means month in Hebrew, right? So a chodesh hazeh. Um, so why does it say hazeh? Like, why does it say this month instead of just like this, the month? Like, it doesn't need to say hazeh. It's an extra word that means this. So, so why is this extra word? And I thought this was a really sweet um, teaching. So that's why I included it. I'll kind of, I'm just going to summarize it for you because... Of, of time. Um, but yeah, so basically what they're saying is Moses was confused. What, what did God mean about like this new moon? Because of course, back in the day, you would declare a new month when you saw the new moon. And what did that look like? And how do you do it? Right, Moses had a lot of questions. It's like, what, how does this work? I'm new to looking at the moon. Can you help me? And so this this midrash or this this commentary that Rashi is citing says, well, actually, God waited for it to become dark and showed Moses, and he was like, this 
this is what the moon looks like. And I just thought that was really sweet, um, kind of experiential education moment where Moses wasn't sure and God pointed out like, this is what you need to look for. I don't know. I just like that. Okay. Um, so that was the Haza is God saying like this, look at that, look at that moon. That's what you need to look for, for the new month. Okay. Oh my gosh. Lots of things in the chat. Um, wow. Yes. Okay. And people still have, yes. Oh my goodness. Okay. Great. I love it all. Please keep going. <laughs> um, it's hard to, okay. So here we have, uh, our last one. So this is Sforno, another commentator on the same Exodus 12 too. He said from now on, these months will be yours to do it as you like. This is by way of contrast to the years when you were enslaved and you had no control over your time or timetable at all. While you were enslaved, your days, hours, minutes even were always at the beck and call of your taskmasters. Right. so again, this is what uh, some people already wrote in the chat, maybe you intuited. Um, but yeah, it's about, it's about freedom and, and being free. Part of being free is being in control of our own time. So the Israelites couldn't mark the new month and, and do those things to celebrate when they were slave, when they were enslaved because they weren't able to mark their own time. But now as they're, well, they're not even free yet, right? They're about to be free. This is, remember, it's, we're at the 10th plague. Um, so this is almost looking into the future and, and almost giving them a sense of hope, right? Say, okay, your time's about to be yours. Uh, so what, so what are you going to do with it? Which I, which I think is cool, um, kind of a, maybe giving them that sense of hope, especially after the plague of darkness. There's like, a, okay, we're, we're getting to the end here. This is, this is something you need to prepare for. Your time is going to be your own. And um, yeah, so I guess my kind of final question <laughs> around this, and I'm going to um, stop the share is just to think about um, this way of uh, that Sephorno kind of highlighted is that to be free means to be in control of our own time. And I know for me, I don't always feel in control of my own time. I think, you know, lots of things with work or um, maybe family obligations that I haven't entirely chosen, but are things that I have to do. Um, and so thinking about how, you know, what are some ways that we use our time that help us to feel free? Um, and also, I think, I mean, this is a great example. You all took I don't think anyone's requiring you to be here and you all took the time to say, you know what, Friday is at 1030 or whatever time it is in your time zone, maybe 730 a.m., whatever. Um, I'm going to learn some Torah. Um, and I think that's a really amazing thing. And um, I'd love to hear either in the chat or if you have, um, if you want to make a brief comment, we have a few more minutes um, to, to mention about time and, and kind of time as freedom and, and how this first commandment that the Jews get is around time. Um, oh, yes. Okay. We got some great chat questions, chat answers. Um, right. It's interesting how prisoners mark their time waiting so they can become free. Yeah, there's like that countdown. Um, time is what Heschel sees as Judaism's key gift, especially the demarcation of time that is Shabbat. Yeah, Shabbat's huge, right? This idea that we can stop work and that being one of these ultimate symbols of freedom. I mean, even in, you know, Friday night Kiddush, when we say the blessing over the wine and we say, um, you know, we're commemorating creation, yes, but also the freedom from Egypt. And why? Because we have the freedom to stop work and to have this time as our own. Um, yeah. Uh, anyone, anyone else? I don't see, I can't see all of you on one screen, so I don't know if people have hands. Oh yes. Okay. If you want to raise your hand, it's down under the reactions button. Um, but I can only really see people on the first screen as well. So it's hard to, um, okay. I see Aaron. Yes. Um, so what this brought to mind for me is that sometimes we can find ourselves waiting for the perfect time to start something new. Um, and I think this January time period for us in the civil calendar is a really big indicator of that. So many people are like, oh, I'm going to start my New Year's resolution on January 1st, and that's when I'm going to eat healthy. That's when I'm going to go work out. But this was a moment where the Israelites were told, you make your own time. This is your new beginning. It is only yours. No one else has ownership over this. Like I can think of so many times in my life where I didn't do something because I kept thinking it has to be the right time to start journaling or learn how to knit. And then when you just jump into it, it happens. It don't have to be 
it doesn't have to be perfect. And I think that this like marking the new calendar and basically being like, just because this has significance for you, because the thing happened, like go ahead and just say, this is the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And you bring up a great point that that way we have, you know, our, our secular new year where a lot of people say, okay, I'm going to make a new year's resolution. I want to start a new habit or, or whatever it is. Well, in the Jewish calendar, we have lots of opportunities for you um, because we have this new month every month. And so that could be a time. I know some people are part of like Rosh Chodesh circles where they'll gather together with a group of friends to commemorate the new month. Um, the Rosh Chodesh for this month was actually pretty recently. So uh, you could still do one <laughs> or you could just wait till the next month. Um, but there are lots of times to start over. I mean, we have Rosh Chodesh. We have Shabbat every week where we mark a new week. We have, you know, many Jewish New Year's. Fun fact, Nisan, which is the month that Passover is in, is the first month. So in some ways that's a, a new year. And then we have you know, Tishrei when the year number switches on Rosh Hashanah. So that's a new year. We got a lot of them. So um, yeah, so don't wait. There's always a good time, a good significant Jewish time <laughs> for you to start something. So not an excuse to wait. There's always a good time. Um, yeah, and I see something. COVID showed us how to stop and the great resignation. Yeah, right. this idea of to saying, hey, you know, this job isn't working for me um, and I'm going to take my time back and I'm able to. And, and that's definitely a sense of, of freedom there. To be Shabbat, of course, how can I progress to be Shabbat New Year for the trees that's coming up? So, you know what, if you made a resolution and it hasn't been going so well, very soon you can just start over again because you have the New Year for the trees. So that's great, um, especially if you want to do like a nature related uh, resolution. Um, okay. Well, I see our time. Oh, so, okay. I see. I know. I'm sorry. I know that Tanya had her hand up in Esther and I know we're running out of time. So I'm so sorry, um, to, to not be able to hear from you. If you want to write what you're thinking in the chat, I would love to see it. Um, but again, thank you all so much for being here. It was really such a pleasure to get to learn with all of you, Parshat Bo. And remember, if you remember all of this for Passover, that's a success. Um, but to think about time, think about darkness, thinking about how we can connect uh, with each other and use our time as free people um, to connect and help alleviate that darkness and that loneliness in the world. So thank you and Shabbat Shalom. And uh, yeah, so I turn it back to Julie.